the ways in which words were said as opposed to what is said. Strange lighting and sound and the eradication of the stage as a way of separating actor from audience. Largely important to him was the use of many traditional theatrical elements, reworked so that the focus was on the audience's nerves and senses, and would leave them more emotionally exhausted than lightly entertained. Antonin Artaud is often referred to as a great theorist for the theater. This is actually incorrect. According to Stoppelman, Antonin Artaud is the theorist for the destruction of the theater. For these reasons, Artaud is seen as the total rebellious artist. Antoine Marie Joseph Artaud was born on the morning of September 4, 1896, at Four Rue des Jardins. Des Plateaus in Marseille. Tragedy and illness, both mental and physical, constantly disturbed the young Artaud. Being the young, oldest of several children came with a price, and that most of his siblings died during illness. Surely this war upon the senses of the youngster, along with his contracted meningitis at an early age, was nearly dead in hand. Much of his youth was spent with agonizing pain in various hospitals. At the age of 19, due to sharp headaches and depression, Anton allowed himself to be checked into a sanatorium. After a year, he was drafted into the army, which only lasted a brief few months due to uh, health complications. Then he was back to the Swiss sanatorium for the next two years. During this period, he was encouraged as part of his therapy to remove, remain as free as possible. This created a force to carry over to his doctor in Paris, Dr. Edward Talus, editor of the Maine, who published Antonin's, Antonin's poetry and employed him as an editorial assistant. Arteau had even gone so far as to mail his poems to another editor, Jacques Rivière, who rejected his poems at first, but after Arteau wrote back seeking to explain himself, a friendly communication between them was born, which resulted in Arteau's letters to the editor being published. These letters are considered very important due to their philosophical philosophies towards poetry and his various mental issues. In one letter to Arteau on March 15, 1924, Rivera pointed out an interesting, interesting contradiction in Arteau. He was really good at uh, figuring out his uh, inner workings of his body when he was sick, but he had no control over his inner demons and such. Oh man. During this time also, Antonin was prescribed opium, more precisely laudanum, which is a mixture of alcohol and opium, for his continuous pump pain. This would prove to be one of Arteau's greatest hardships from that day until his death. There were many attempts at intoxicating, but his inner demons and constant pain of delivering him into relapse after relapse after relapse after relapse. As bothersome as his addiction was, it certainly be cited as one of the as one of the important catalysts for his form of his form of art. From early on, Antonin had decided poetry was the most important thing in life. It wasn't just the side of poetry which was important to him. Poetry was meant to be lived on an everyday basis. One's own movements should be poetic, even if it's meant to harm to oneself. This philosophy it also will continue on to his death. One group in particular that Arto found agreement with was the Surrealists, at least to a great degree and for a limited amount of time. But the impact of the union was profound while it lasted. Their movement was a massive attempt in the liberation of mankind and rebellion against the authority figures of family constraints. Antonin loved rebellion. They also sought to bring forth the unconsciousness in their eyes to make our dreams and our nightmares into our realities. Anarchy seemed to be their goal, but as Andre Breton and most of the others who really started moving towards communism, Arteau made his exit. He felt communism was moving in the wrong direction of what he saw as his destination. Along the way, Anthony started to put the thought into what kind of kid he would like to exist. One of the first things that hit his head was the issue of language. He saw very little purpose in the theater for language. He felt as though it was the direct product of literature. Antonin was of the opinion that if theater was to ever have its own voice, language needed to be scrapped as the central component of the storyline. 
So begin the following of the philosophical thought pieces in two parts. In 1926, Anton and company with Roger Bartlett and Robert Aaron opened the outdoor deck. This theory was short-lived, but gave Anton the insights required to further his ideals on the new theater. Also around this time, he became part of the Atelier Theater led by Charles Dillon. A further group of influence of Bill Lennon, Arto decided to attend a play by Japanese and Japanese theater. This hit Arto like an anvil to the head. He was, he had, was bored by their use of sound, visuals, maps, and other such elements, and inspired by the way it resembled an ancient religious life. It was about this time the seeds of his theatrical idea began to flourish. That the flow of the group from Arto's mind quickly became more like a Venus flytrap. His ideas started to form shape of what he called the theater of cruelty. Cruelty, according to Arto, was not about being cruel in actions towards others, but dealt more with the cruelty of objects in the ways that we left them on us. This was a theater of insanity and sensory derangement. The bridge between art and the real world blurred more than ever. Language and plays became almost obsolete. The emphasis was no longer on what was spoken. The emphasis was on the way it should be. Words and phrases combined with breathing and screaming exercises took on quite new meaning opposite from the everyday meanings. That gesture and, and compulsion to this and words such as house, house, house can take on a much more sinister route becoming less a place of solace and more like a prison. His vision was to bring theater back to the point of creating magic. He wanted to abandon the practice of performing a play the same every time. He felt the energy of the actors was only effective when it came from a truly, truly primal place. A place free of repetition. Also important to cruelty was instruments and lights being used in a way to create a form, form of panic in the spectator. Equally effective was the decision to eradicate the use of the stage. He felt the audience should serve more purpose than only to watch. He felt the audience as a sort of unwilling performer. He wanted them to be fully, as fully immersed in the situation as the performer. Another thing that to hit the talking point was the director. The writers should have no separation between themselves and the finished piece. This guaranteed a much more faithful representation. During this period, Anthony had started relating the theater of cruelty to the play when he wrote the theater and the play. Uh, he saw a direct point in the arrival of, of, of both to towns where his people would start convulsing and moving in painful ways. Language got reduced to moans and screams, and the basic fabric of society started to unravel. Shortly after, Anthony did a speech on the play. But he didn't limit himself to only speech during the presentation. He fell to the floor and started writing, convulsing. Most of the audience only laughed or left the room. Around 1935, Arto, after many years of studying societies and their ancient rituals, decided to travel to Mexico to learn the ways of the time Humara Indians and hoping to partake of their peyote ritual. To Arto, the ritual was, it was exactly everything he saw from the theater of cruelty. After defending their lives through a series of public speeches, he was allowed to participate in such a prison, after which he broke the peyote box. After leaving Mexico and heading to Ireland for what was a disaster split, he returned home in a straight jacket and remained institutionalized for the next nine years. He was bounced around from various places, one of which had been overrun by Nazis. They had decided inmates were undesirable and left them to starve to death. At this time, various old friends had been shot to bury the kitchen to have them transferred to the Nazi manual death. Though the institution was not supreme, it was most definitely not better. The doctor was convinced electroshock therapy was to cure all the sins and subjected Anton to more than 50 sessions over 19 months. Anton stayed true to the, to the cruelty for much of the rest of his life. On March 4, 1948, Anton passed away in his sleep while sitting up. It was just a request that he not be made to sleep lying down. The lasting influence of Anton Arteo has been felt more strongly since his death and his great to the theater of the absurd and the theater of panique. 
as use humor and equal doses of sadism and blasphemy to shock the audience. Other uh, such fans of his work were Edward Albee and Peter Brooks. On a personal note, I can't help but look at the band I've fronted for more than a decade and not see some form of Artogian influence. From the beginning, we saw the eradication of music, which inspired dancing in favor of a more primitive and cerebral approach to sound. The stage has been something our, we ourselves did away with somewhat years ago. Our audience uh, quickly becomes the experience they came to witness and most often leaves in some way changed. Whether they are bleeding profusely or suddenly awakened to new ways of thinking, nine out of ten are forever changed for the better. I can only come up with two conclusions. One, everyone I've ever been influenced by has had an Arto book in their library. Or, two, Anton Arto has possessed us all. I like two better. <laughs> Couple of things. Where, one, you just won life. What do you mean you just won life? You win. You just won life. You just won. Ah, yeah, right? You just, you know, <laughs>